We have played another session of The Veil. The Veil is a cyberpunk role-playing game powered by the Apocalypse, produced by Samjoko Publishing. Three of us have decided that we are going to explore this game and share game mastering responsibilities or MCing responsibilities as we go through. So the three of us will each run three sessions for a total of a nine-session campaign. Now, it's our habit in, uh, in this little group that we belong to on YouTube to make videos discussing our reflections on the videos after we've played. But in this particular group of three Game Masters, it's also our habit to discuss the session immediately afterward and keep that as a part of the live session. So if you do watch the live session, which I will link in this video, then stay through all the way to the end and you'll see our immediate reactions to things like mechanics or implementation of mechanics or the feel or the mood of the session and whatnot. So this reflections video is more as a matter of course than as a matter of, of need for the experiment. But there are a few things that upon reflection as a few hours afterward that I wanted to say. At the end of the actual play session, our discussion touched on the idea that this second full session of play was really an exploration of the new and growing relationship between the two player characters which have been introduced so far. That of Tess, who's built from the Apparatus playbook, and Cadmus, who's built from the Dying playbook. And these two characters, again, through just being thrown together by circumstance, have been given the opportunity to recognize something familiar in each other. And like any new friendship, there's a little bit of awkwardness and a little bit of curiosity. So a lot of the session, as we described, was the characters having deep and philosophical discussions, almost too extreme, almost too avert, you know, in the way that, that people who've just met kind of put on a mask or put on a front to exaggerate or emphasize aspects of themselves. And this interaction was played out against a backdrop of the dystopian future that we are creating in our Appalachian Heights setting. So it was very satisfying in terms of role play. I think for someone maybe watching the session, unless those two characters grab you and you want to see how they interact with each other, it would be difficult to say that anything really happened in the session. However, it is the basis for everything that's going to happen in the remaining seven sessions. Now, as I mentioned earlier, three of us are running the game. Three of us are playing in the game. So the next session will be the last session of the first MC. Right. So after that, Ivan is going to take over. And we'll have a new game master, but we'll have more familiarity with the system. So a new kind of awkwardness will come. And then after his three sessions, then I will take over to finish things off. And we'll have the most familiarity, but we'll have, again, a new game master. So this whole process should be quite interesting. And how often are we going to have sessions like this one? Maybe never again. Maybe because of the result of this session, we'll begin to use the moves more. We'll begin to exert more control over the passage of time. We will begin to take larger shares of the narrative. Who can say? Because one of the flaws that, that I spotted in my own play, and I think Ivan recognized in his own play, is that once things started to heat up, once the, the role play started to flow naturally from the contributing factors in the scene, our role play became very focused on our own personal experience. What we were exchanging was dialogue and tone and nothing else. We weren't engaging in narrative description of play. We weren't taking an authorial stance and sharing imagery and motion and description. 
we were just talking. We were inhabiting the moment. And while that is very satisfying, it doesn't completely address what this game is set up to do. We weren't fully engaging with the game. Now, as a result, we ended up with a very satisfying and very important session. But that cannot continue, or at least it's highly unlikely for it to continue. We must make an effort to change how we narrate and how we interact in roleplay in order to actually be playing this game to its full extent. Drawing on things like obligation, making moves, right? making the session be about the things that we want it to be about in a way that feels to me not very collaborative. It feels very selfish. And while that's not a correct response, that is the response that I have. And there's one specific thing I want to point out as an example of this. I think over the course of all my years playing, one of the initially unwritten, but then later on written and oft repeated rules of play was if there's something that happens in a session that you don't like, roll with it. And then after the session, talk about it if you can, or if you still care. And after the first session, there was a use of a game master move, which I didn't really appreciate. I didn't think uh, it was something that I wanted to do. And I, I thought about it. Do I want to talk about this with the other guys or not? Is this something that is just bothering me because of who I am and the way I like to play? Or is this something I think was an actual error? Or is it a little bit of both? What? So we had a good discussion about it in private. And we're talking about the Game Master move of uh, take away their stuff, basically, which is a good move to make. But what we talked about was how to make a move like that not be a blunt instrument, but instead serve the fictional environment of the current scene, to be in context, to not be discordant. And I'm glad that I voiced that, uh, that piece of feedback. I'm glad it was received in the spirit with which it was intended was, did we do this right? Because I, I feel dissatisfied with how that scene went and have everybody chime in with, you know, similar kind of thinking and a clear plan of what to do going forward. So in this session, I had a similar response. The character that I'm playing is called Cadmus, and the playbook is The Dying, as I've mentioned. And as you can imagine with a, a descriptor like that, the character is actively dying. And they're on the clock, they're on a timeline. And this is because of a disease, and I'm responsible for creating the nature of this disease in a sense, meaning I have to choose or create the symptoms that manifest. I have to choose or create the timeline on which the character is dying. And I have to choose or create the negative ramifications of using the few benefits that come from being a victim of this disease. So in other words, the way the character looks, feels, acts, these are all supposed to come from me. There have been times when description has been applied to the character during play. And I'm trying to be open to that because I'm thinking that maybe I don't like that because of the nature of collaboration I have heretofore engaged in. But maybe not. Maybe when another narrator in the scene tells me what my character looks like, or how my character reacts, even if this is the uh, expression of a symptom of the disease, maybe they're stepping into a zone of my narrative control, and maybe instead of telling me, they should be asking me. And this sets up a conflict for me because I want to inhabit the character, and I want to hear description and respond. I don't want what seems to me like the game to stop so that a player can ask me as the player a question, have me think about the answer, and then portray that. That is 
kind of a hitching stop and start, I don't know how to use the clutch kind of forward motion. It's a different way to play. And of course, as anybody who drives standard understands, eventually you do learn how to use the clutch and then eventually you learn how to use the clutch so smoothly that you don't even notice that you're doing it. How long will it take me, who prefers to drive automatic, <laughs> to get there? And that's the interesting question. I think I probably will, I don't know, insist is too strong a word. I think I will probably request that description of how the symptoms of the dying manifest uh, be in my zone of control. Right. We roll, we determine that symptoms manifest, and I describe them. I think moving forward, that might be the right thing to do. That might even be what is intended in the playbook. Right now, I don't have a lot of certainty about that. But what I do know is that I'm developing both an intellectual interest in how this character is developed through play, but I'm also developing an attachment to the character of two types. There are things about this character that I do not like as a person. Would I like this character as a person? And I would like to play more to find out if he becomes more of the things I don't like or if he becomes more of the things that I do like. I find that to be a great place to be sitting as a player. And I like the conflict and the the discordancy thing, the, the disconnect that I experience as he's building his friendship with Tess. What is that based in? And where is it going? I want to answer these questions. And so I think these are good characters, and I think we're having a good game. And I think it's possible to survive mistakes that happen in play and to grow stronger from them if you're willing to talk about them. Now soon, it will be Ivan's turn to take over, and Ivan will have a different flow. Ivan's game will have a different feel, but Ivan will be trying, I believe, to match what has come before, and then it will be my turn to match both things which have come before. And I'm looking forward to that challenge, and I'm hoping that when we get there, the discussion of the game will still be like this, still be asking questions, still be making suggestions, and not have reached the point where there's a lot of certainty about the game. Because after all, it will only be nine sessions. No instant expertise desired. For me, this exploration has been really interesting as it dances between how I've basically always done things and things that I have to learn consciously to do, right? Building new habits. Because the the flow of play, it feels very familiar sometimes, and then it feels very awkward and right now a little artificial or inefficient in other times. Part of that is how the game actually works. Part of that is how I am using the game. Part of that is how we are coming together as a group. There's a lot of factors going on. So it's very enjoyable. It's very refreshing, especially when it highlights a point of bias that under examination cannot be justified or when it highlights a point of bias and reinforces it. I find all of this to be very interesting and satisfying. It also helps to highlight something that over the years I've noticed about games which are built on the same engine or the same system of mechanics. How there are some lineages of games where the play feels pretty much the same. And there are other lineages of games where tweaks, manipulations, or additions to the system cause much larger ripples in the experience of play than it might seem on the surface. Do all Powered by the Apocalypse games 
play the same way? Do all D100 games play the same? Do all Ubiquity games play the same? Sometimes that answer is, yeah, it feels pretty much, it's just like a different setting with different character choices. But other times it is a very different experience. And The Veil is one of those games where you can point directly to specific mechanics and say, this is different. But it also contains elements which might be different. When we look at beliefs, how similar are these to a belief system or structure present in other Powered by the Apocalypse games? Or is there something about it that needs to be re-examined or explored? Or is there some kind of leap that we need to make to get to the a balanced understanding of this mechanic in this game? We can point specifically to the states. We can look at the fact that that roles are drawn from the current emotional state of the character. And think about why that is and how that's affecting things and how that should color narration. That makes it substantially different from any other Powered by the Apocalypse game so far. When we look at beliefs and how they function on, on play, is this something that should be more informed by how that type of mechanic has appeared in other games or less? Do we need to be more open to a general understanding of it or do we need to zoom in on a very specific veil oriented understanding of it? How much should we allow the experience of other games to color our perception of it in this game? When are we really playing the veil and when are we importing our perceptions from other games, our habits from other games. And that is a question that I love. And I hope maybe during these nine sessions that we have planned, we might be able to at least crack that nut. But anyway, this is the end of my reflections on session number two. I'm very much looking forward to session number three, and hopefully that will happen in the next two weeks or so. So until then, thanks for watching.